The Mises Institute is proud to present the Lew Church Memorial Lecture in Religion and Economics. Made possible by the Lew Church Educational Foundation, Dr. Robert D. Hemholt, Chairman, this annual lecture seeks to honor the late Lew Church, a Florida businessman and advocate of liberty, and the ideas to which he was dedicated. Starting out as a, a swimming pool cleaner, Mr. Church eventually established successful businesses in swimming pool construction and the restaurant and travel industries. Through it all, he dedicated himself to the values of the free market, private property, free association, entrepreneurship, and liberty, realizing that big government threatened not only the free enterprise system, but all that is good about America. Our lecturer is Mustafa Akil. Um, he's a, a Turkish political commentator and author based in Istanbul, Turkey. Akil graduated from inter the International Relations Department of the Bos Bosphorus University. He completed his master's thesis on the Curtis question at the history department of the same university. He has given seminars in several universities and think tanks in the U.S. and the U.K. on issues relating to Islam and modernity. Since 2002, he has been a regular commentator in the Turkish media. He is currently a regular columnist for Hurriyet Daily News, Turkey's foremost English language daily. He also writes a regular column for the Turkish language daily Star. Akil's articles have also appeared in Foreign Affairs, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, International Herald Tribune, Newsweek, The American Interest, First Things, The Weekly Standard, The Washington Times, and many other publications. Uh, Mustafa Akil has a book in Turkish titled Rethinking the Kurdish Qu Question, What Went Wrong? What Next? His forthcoming book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, will be published by Norton, in July 2011. Uh, it is my pleasure to present Mustafa Akyal, who will um, address us on the, <laughs> <laughs> the commercial heritage and contribution of Islam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, and uh, first I should thank Mises Institute for flying me all over from Istanbul to Alabama. Uh, it's a it's really a pleasure and privilege to be here. I, I had a chance to you know see friends, meet new friends, and even um, taste grits at breakfast, which was quite an experience and <laughs> quite nice, I should say. Um, I mean, when I got this invitation, this kind of invitation from the Mises Institute a few months ago to speak about Islam's commercial heritage, I said, yeah, sure, I would love to, uh, because uh, I think in the West right now there is focus on some unpleasant elements in the Islamic world. And sure, sure we, do, we have them. And, you know, why we have them is, is a big, big question, and we can get into that too. But we have some nasty people doing some nasty things in the name of their religion in, in our part of the world. We have nasty people doing nasty things in some other, in the name of other religions as well. But there's focus on Islam right now, which is understandable in the West. But that's not the, old, the only side of the story. There, Islam is a like 14th century old civilization and actually, some of the some of the facts within the Islamic uh, history are quite surprising. Uh, I mean, to to a, a modern uh, maybe observer who think that who maybe presumes that there is not much thing to learn from Islam. It's quite the contrary. It's quite interesting, especially from a business angle. If you are like a like a believer in free market, if you're if you're a believer in capitalism, Islam has an interesting story to tell. So let me try to share that with you a little bit. Um, among the, the founders of the world's great religions, if I'm not wrong, there's only one who's a businessman, and that's Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he was a businessman, quite a successful one. He was a merchant uh, until the age of 40. I mean, he started, you know, I mean, Mecca, where he was born and raised, uh, was the trade center of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, it was also the religious center. It had the Kaaba, which had turned into a pagan pantheon. So that's another story. But it was also the business center. And Muhammad was a very successful merchant uh, who married to a woman older than himself at the age of 25. And, you know, they established a very successful enterprise. Uh, he became a prophet only at the age of 40 when in a cave, as Muslims believe, including myself, believe that he heard a voice, you know, telling him to, you know, worship God and proclaim that there is only one God to a basically a polytheist society. And that's, that's where the story of Islam begins. 
but the fact that Muhammad was a businessman had obvious influence on his thinking. So when you look at the hadiths, which are the recorded or the alleged words of Prophet Muhammad, because they're always controversial, they were written a few centuries after the Prophet, uh, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. But anyway, when you look at his words and what he said, you can find very interesting remarks. Like he said, uh, he's on record for saying, uh, like nine out of ten of God's blessings come from trade. Ah, pretty like a pro-trade uh, argument. But there's another tale, like when Prophet Muhammad was in Medina, the second city he you know, migrated from Mecca because of religious persecution. And people you know, come to him at some point, Muslims, and they say, the, the, the people, the merchants at the market are selling, uh, uh, selling their goods with a very heavy, very high price, very dearly. And can you fix the market? Can you fix the price? And his answer was, well, no, only God fixes the prices. Which, from which many Muslim free-minded thinkers have inferred the idea that there should be a secret hand, a divine hand maybe, but not a human hand, obviously, which fix prices in the market. Um, and, well, th that's the Prophet's career. And when you look at the Quran, which the revelation that Muslims believe that he got from you know, God and gave to, to human beings, uh, you can also see that it's quite a pro-business book, if you will. Uh, maybe, anyway, to begin with, I mean, maybe it's interesting to note that the longest verse in the Quran, which is in the su uh, chapter, the surah, chapter Baqarah, 282, which is like a le page long, it's about how to write a proper loan contract. <laughs> um, it is. Uh, and th the fact that the, most of the early Muslims were merchants can be traced in the language of the Quran, because while Quran is preaching people, it's using an almost a merchant language. There are many verses in the Quran which says, you know, the, the contract between God and men will be rewarded in afterlife. The covenant is defined as a contract. Uh, so many scholars who have actually studied the Islamic, the language of the Quran uh, from a very like a linguistic perspective, Arabic, have, have thought that this is, a, this is appealing to a very commercial society. Uh, and also, like it's, it might be interesting to note that uh, the, the, the Islam doesn't have the exact idea of a Sabbath, you know, a day that you stop work, but there is the idea of a Friday, that's, which is a holy day, that you stop you know, what you do and you go to mosque. But in the words that orders Muslims to do the Friday prayer, it's very interesting, the chapter. Uh, it says, do your trade before the prayers, and when, when you're called for prayer, leave everything and come to prayer. When you're done, go back to your work and seek for God's blessings and bounties. So, um, there are many examples like this from the Quran and the prophetic tradition, which actually defines Islam as a very, like a, at least a, like a, a trade-oriented religion. Uh, and a scholar who actually wrote a really good book on this, for those of you who would like to be you know, interested, who'd like to uh, look, look into this more, is a Maxim Rodinson, who's actually a French Marxist, but who wrote this book, Islam and Capitalism, in the uh, 1960s. And being a Marxist, he was not a fan of capitalism, but he thought Islam is a very capitalist religion. Muhammad was not a socialist, you know, he emphasized uh, in the book. Uh, and that book really still is, is a good source. You know, he, he evaluated the Quran and the Hadith and, you know, look at, uh, deep into those issues. Uh, there are, though, some some other themes in the Quran which had led some Muslims to a more socialistic interpretation of the faith. And the two of them are, first, the idea of zakat, which means almsgiving, uh, which you can interpret that way in English, and which is about charity, I mean, helping the poor. Uh, and like a very, you know, oft-quoted uh, word, uh, like a uh, saying by prophet says, uh, that person is not a good Muslim if he's uh, if his neighbor is hungry, but he's you know sleeping with a full stomach. That you know your neighbor is hungry, you should feed your neighbor. And many Muslims I know infer a kind of a socialist paradigm from this. And I always say to them, well, the Prophet doesn't say go and call the welfare state if your neighbor is hungry. It tells you to take care of your neighbor. So it's, it is your personal responsibility to care for the people in need. So it's a moral responsibility on the individual uh, believer. And not, it doesn't define a, you know, like a centralized redistribution of wealth. Uh, 
some people want to understand that way, but I think it's not the really right way to understand the Islamic idea of charity. So zakat, that's why in, in Islamic tradition, zakat has been a civil uh, duty. And you know Muslims are supposed to go and look for the society and find poor people and needy people and help them themselves rather than redistribution of wealth kind of system. Another theme in the Quran, which is of course uh, very much debated and is, and, and is shown by some Muslims as an objection to the capitalist economy, is the ban on interest. Uh, but whether that is interest or not, that's actually a good, good question and that's a debated question. The Quran denounces something called riba, and that means an overextended, uh, like, like an over uh, achieved, like, uh, 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 wealth in, in just a short period. But 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 the, some scholars who look at what riba is having just concluded that this is actually usury, like an overextend, like an emphasized usury. And at the time when you look at Mecca, there were like people who were lending money, just maybe a hundred dollars. There were no dollars at the time, like golds or you know some precious uh, money. And they were asking like two, twice of that in, in the next week or something. And when you did not give that, you know, you would be in trouble and so on. So that was an like an extensive uh, interest. Whereas uh, some scholars think that in the modern age, banking interest is something different from that. So, I mean, there, there should be a distinction between interest and usury. But still, the idea that riba is uh, interest, and so there should be an alternative Islamic banking is still quite popular in the Muslim world. And there are Islamic banks which do some, actually use some legal tricks to go over the ban on usury. But they do do some, uh, obviously, uh, financing tr without, uh, without the idea of interest. Uh, and I think in a free economy, it's, 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 it is possible to choose between Islamic banking and a normal banking, and as it is in Turkey where I come from. I mean, the Muslims who have an idea that you know, they should do, do, find a way to go without you know, interest, they, they can use that. Uh, but that still, do, I mean, that does, doesn't stop them from establishing businesses, obviously, and you know, taking loans from uh, the Islamic banks. Now, another aspect of the Sharia, and I, I actually recall that uh, quite obviously when I was listening to the lecture on Hayek, just the lecture before, the idea that law is discovered. It's not, you know, dictated by the state, but it's out there, and you discover law. And that is actually very relevant for the Islamic civilization because of the whole notion of the Sharia. Islamic law. Now, I know that the Sharia is not a very popular term. <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, people do very harsh things in the name of the Sharia. You know, chopping of hands and, you know, lashing people, or especially suppression of women in the Muslim world. Uh, and that's a real, real, real problem that we should be talking about. But that is one way of understanding the Sharia. And the problem in that understanding of the Sharia, which is popular, especially in places like Afghanistan, uh, under Taliban, is that the proponents of the Sharia, which is Islamic law, insist on implementing it as it was written some 10 centuries ago. Like, if you insist on implementing British common, or like English common law, that would be pr pretty brutal, you know, in the modern world. Uh, so if you take the letter of what Sharia is and bring it today, and, and if you take a legal system which was designed in an age where you did not have correctional facilities, the only way to punish your crime is basically either to kill or you know, physically give some pain uh, to the culprit, which was the case in 7th century Arabia, then yeah, I mean, Sharia was understandable in that, in that uh, environment, but we live in a different world right now. So there, there obviously needs to be a reform of the Sharia if, you, if you, people will go, go on and implement the Sharia. Um, but, but let's leave that aside for a moment and let's think what the Sharia is. I mean, if you look at like an encyclopedia or something, it will say, well, Sharia is Islamic law as it is developed by scholars. And many people read that and just go, and well, the fact that it is developed by scholars was crucial because it means it was not dictated by the state. Uh, let me tell you what this means. Like, the Sharia was based on the Quran, but very vaguely on the Quran, because the Quran, like the New Testament, is not a legal book. It speaks mostly about theology, God, afterlife, and m morality. But there are a few principles in the Quran that you can you know, deduct from, some laws from. M more on the hadiths. Uh, what, the Hadith was the bulk of the Sharia, the sayings attributed to Prophet Muhammad, and just the legal opinions of the scholars at the time. But what happened was that when Islam became a civilization, and, you know, a big state right after uh, the death of Prophet Muhammad, 
Islamic scholars and sat down and made these laws, the Sharia laws. But since they were not government employees, their interest was not about serving the state and its ambitions. Their interest was about ser- uh, keeping justice, upholding justice actually under the state. Uh, that's why actually when you look at the hist- history of Islamic law, you see the Sharia acting as a constraint on the temporal authority rather than being a you know, tool of the temporal authority. And there are many examples of this, like uh, in the 14th century, El- when El Hilji, the Muslim ruler in India, uh, the, the, when there was an Islamic empire at the time, which built Taj Mahal and many other things there, when he wanted to overtax his Hindu subjects, his top scholar, Sheikh al-Islam, whose job was to oversee the state according to, uh, to, to the Sharia, he said, you cannot do this. That's against the laws of the Sharia. And Hilji complained, he said, whenever I want to consolidate my power, someone tells me that this is against the Sharia. And there are many other cases that, you know, the rulers are blocked by the Sharia and its moral authority, which had the moral authority it had in society, uh, to do something which was excessive. And one scholar who really studied what this, this aspect of the Sharia was, uh, Chaim Garbar, an Israeli scholar at the Hebrew University, he studied Ottoman court decisions uh, of the six, 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. And he found very interesting cases in which the mufti, the legal scholar whose job is to protect the Sharia, blocks the ruler from doing something which violates the rights of the individuals. One case, for example, was when Yavuz the, the ninth Ottoman Sultan, Yavuz Selim, Selim the Grim, which was a very heavy-handed Sultan, uh, he, co- he considered converting all Christians and Jews in the Ottoman Empire into Islam, forcibly. Now, Sharia grants that Jews and Christians have their religious freedom. They are not equal citizens, you know, like Muslims, but they have the right to worship in Islamic lands. That's why in Islamic lands, you know, Christian communities continued until today. So when the, when the Sultan thought about converting all Christians into Islam forcibly for the sake of politics, for the sake of homogeneity for his empire. The, it was his top scholar, again, the Sheikh al-Islam said, you cannot do this, and this is against the Sharia. Another uh, example that Chaim Garber, again, the Israeli scholar, gives in his book, uh, book about the Ottoman society and culture, is a, is a religious fatwa, a ruling by a by a mufti, a, a legal scholar, an Islamic scholar in the 17th century Palestine. There was a case in the city of Lod. Uh, there, were, there, was, there was a local governor, the Pasha, uh, which was a secular, I mean, it was an Ottoman like a, uh, a government official, but his, his, it was, his, his task was secular. And th- then you have the mufti. So there are many immigrants to this country, to the city from the village, and the governor thinks, well, let's just send them back. It's, the city has become too crowded. So he decides to just send people away, to back to their villages. He doesn't like to see peasants around. Now the Muf, But the peasants go to the mufti, and the mufti gives a fatwa, which reads, it is not permissible to force them to emigrate from a town they have taken to be their home and to which they have become accustomed. For the believer is the lord of his soul. He may live in whichever country he sees fit, and whichever town he chooses, it's not permissible to harass them. So here is the, here is the reason why, why Muslim societies still have a deep respect for the notion of the Sharia. I mean, this is, I know this is surprising to Westerners. I mean, people are cutting hands, and, but every Sharia-promoting party becomes very popular in the Muslim world. Because for them, Sharia is simply means justice. Not the justice of the ruler, which is not justice. <laughs> But the justice which is out there, inherent and God-given ultimately, but as discovered, you know, through just and, you know, fair scholars. But of course, if you, impl- if you try to implement it today, today as it was in the Middle Ages, you have a big problem, and we have a big problem because of that. But even that distinction, whether to sh- take, take Sharia literally or non-literally, was actually discussed in the Middle Ages, and Imam Shatibi of the 14th century from North Africa actually had created a theory of the higher intentions of the Sharia. And he said Sharia has many laws, but when you, when you deduct principles from those laws, you come to basically some fundamental principles. And he said all Sharia is actually about protecting these five things. Protection of life, religion, property, 
lineage and the intellect. The intellect is about like banning alcohol, like uh, d- um, like drugs or you know things like that. Uh, and property is one of the key things about uh, in the Sharia and life, of course. Like so, if Sharia can be taken as such a like a prince, set of principles, and actually it is a good basis to to you know uh, devise a, a culture, a political culture which emphasizes the rights of the individuals rather than the rights of the state, the so-called rights of the state. Uh, well, because of this whole notion of uh, the rights of the individual, which are given by God, like the property rights, which is which also the Quran uh, very much emphasizes property rights. I mean, the Quran bans, uh, of course, theft. It also guarantees inheritance as a right. Hence, you have property rights. Because of these, Islamic civilization had a big success in the Middle Middle Ages because it was a civilization which very much respected the rule of law, with many exceptions, with many tyrants and so on, with many nasty stories too, but there was the idea of rule of law. And under this rule of law, civil society flourished in medieval Islam. Uh, The idea of waqf, which in Arabic means foundation, grew up because the ruler was forbidden from confiscating a, a foundation that I, oh, uh, that I found for the sake of God. So there were many foundations which supported education, which supported, like, which opened soup kitchens, or which supported even scientific research in the Middle Ages. And the ruler was simply forced by the law to respect these things and not confiscate his property. Uh, hence came the sci- scientific boom of the uh, Islamic world. Hence came education, very much, like uh, is- Islamic educational institutions in the med- med- medieval world. Uh, that's why Muslims invented many things in the, in the Middle Ages, which, wa- which were slowly and slowly transferred into Europe, especially during the time of the Crusades, when Crusaders came to the Middle East and learned many new things from the Middle East. Uh, some of these inventions were... Um, quite economic inventions. Let me give you few examples. Muslims devised a legal understanding called a legal uh, form of contract called muhatara, which means actually going over the ban, like the ban on interest, and you know charging interest without you know going against the letter of law. This soon became muhatra in Latin, and Christians in the Middle Ages started to use the same concept. The Islamic concept of mudaraba, in which you know, a few people come and create a company, w- soon appeared in Italy uh, in the 12th or 13th century uh, under the name Commenda, which ultimately became uh, the limited company in the West. Uh, another, another term which made its way from Arabic to the English, the first, first the French and English languages, is the word Sak. Sak in means Arabic written document. And this was a document that Muslims merchants used to, not to, they, they didn't want to carry money from Fez to Baghdad all the way. So they wrote down a paper, and that paper would equal some money, and would, they would go and cash it on the other side of the Islamic civilization. That suck became the check, you know, in the French and, and the British uh, and the English languages. There are actually many terms in Arabic which made their way into English, and let me just give you a few examples. These are terms like algebra, which comes from Al-Jabir, an Islamic scholar in the um, 12th or 14th century. Uh, algorithm, which comes from Al-Kharizmi, another Muslim scholar. Alchemy, Alkali, Amal- Amalgam, Almanac, Alembic, Admiral, Alco, Mask, Nader, Zenith, Tariff, Sugar, Syrup, Checkmate, lute, and guitar. All these come from Arabic. There are, of course, also the Arabic numerals. <laughs> <laughs> so Islam is quite a successful civilization, and one of the success, as Bernard Lewis, you know, not the greatest fan of the Islamic civilization, based on some, you know, at least some considerations, but an expert, certainly, an expert on the Middle East. He says Islam was the most the, the most advanced civilization in the Middle Ages in terms of freedom, in terms of liberty. It gave freedom, freedom to individuals like any other civilization because of this idea of law and rights protected by law. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's why, uh, and as Islam, this was of course a Muslim civilization first, and Muslims were 
you know, the, the ruling uh, class. But Jews and Christians were given certain rights. And that's why many Jews migrated from Europe to Islamic lands when they were persecuted. I mean, the Jews who, were f who fled Spain in uh, 1492, they came to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Sultan welcomed them, and they're being, they have been living in uh, Turkey and the you know, Ottoman lands since the 15th century quite happily. Unfortunately, we have a rapid anti-Semitism today in many parts of the Muslim world, but that came as a response to Israel, and you know, uh, that, that, that's a new phenomenon in the Muslim world. If you look at the, until the 20th century, you know, Muslims, the Muslim world was much more preferable to Europe uh, when, when compared with the, you know, when look, looked, uh, when looked from the perspective of anti-Semitism and right of the Jews. Um, now, all, all these, while all these things were going on on, on, on the ground, a particular scholar even made a theory of Islam and the free market, and that was Ibn Khaldun, uh, a Muslim scholar of the 14th century who lived in North Africa. And Ibn Khaldun is a very interesting figure. He has this book called Muqaddima, which means introduction. The, the longer thing, well, introduction to history, that was his thing. And he actually devised a, like a philosophy of history, and he also... He's also f accepted as a beginner of sociology because he studied how tribes and nations and societies change according to geographic conditions, uh, an idea which would be later developed by Montesquieu in the, uh, in the modern age. But one of Ibn Khaldun's uh, contributions to world thought was the idea that governments should use as minimal taxes as they can because he observed every society around us. And he, in his Muqaddimah, he says... The less, there is, the less tax there is in a land, the more prosperity there is. So he advises governments to minimize taxes. He advises them not to enter, engage in production or trade. He says this should be done by the individual people. And he, uh, he also uh, very much emphasizes protection of property rights. The World Bank, a few years ago, called Ibn Khaldun the first uh, advocate of privatization. Now, there was certainly a success story in, in medieval Islam, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's impossible not to see that. But, but then the question comes, what went wrong? The Bernard Louisian question. It's the right question, what went wrong? Because today, Muslim world is really not the wealthiest part of the world. Well, there's wealth, oil wealth, but it doesn't bring any, any good to anybody. Uh, it is certainly uh, like underdeveloped in many ways, and when you compare it with the West, there's a huge difference. But this is a Difference, this is a huge gap between, uh, between the Muslim world and the West. I mean, in, in favor of the West, it's a new, new phenomenon. In the past three or four centuries, this emerged. This emerged when the West really made a big leap forward with, 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 modern, uh, with the modern world in you know, inventions and si the age of science, science and discovery and capitalism and industrial revolution and so on. So the West went forward. And not just the Muslim world, but the whole world lagged behind the West. I mean, you can say the same thing for Latin, Af Latin America or, or Russia or China or Asia or, you know, especially, of course, Africa as well. Uh, but what went wrong in the Muslim world? And that's a question very much debated between, you know, it's, it's, it's a big historical question. Now, one answer given by some scholars, and I, and I find it very compelling, is that the decline of the Muslim world is very much related with the decline of trade within the Islam, Islamic world. Uh, because when you look at you know, how things evolved within Islam, in the second or third century, there is an interesting dec decline in the role of merchants, which were the original makers of the Sharia. Because when you look at the early Sharia scholars, many of them were merchants themselves. And they, they created a much more dynamic understanding of the Sharia. On the other hand, you see a more stagnant force, which was not which was not in the trade centers, but which were more based in like the Arabian Peninsula, the Hijaz region, and these. This was another school of thought, a more much more dogmatic rather than the rational, you know, scholars of the Sharia, and that becomes gradually dominant in the Muslim world, and and you see a rise of landlords and soldiers, and and, and the empire creating its bureaucracy mainly, you know like bureaucrats, at, at the expense of merchants. Another thing which adds to that is the gradual shift of trade, world trade, from the Muslim world, first to the Mediterranean, and ultimately to North Europe. Actually, the real killer of the Muslim world is 
is the discovery of the route from the oceans to, uh, to India by Vasco da Gama you know, at the end of the 15th century. That changes the whole world trade and the, what we know as the Silk Road gradually declines, oceans become the new, uh, new source of making money and trade. And the decline of trade in Islam leads not only to you know, uh, the loss of wealth, but it leads to the stagnation of minds. Because trade not only creates wealth, but through trade, you travel, new people come and go, you are exposed to new ideas, and thanks to that, you know, a, a civilization becomes much more dynamic by ex being exposed to new ideas. But when you look at the like is Islamic civilization, that's why Baghdad or Basra or you know, Alexandria, Cairo, these were the more uh, it, these were the places where the most brilliant ideas came out in, from Muslim scholars. When you go back to the center of Saudi Arabia, today's Saudi Arabia, there was nothing. There was no new idea. There was, it was a stagnant culture. But that stagnant culture gradually you know, became very powerful and ultimately dominated in Islam. That's why after the 13th or 14th century, you don't really see new ideas in Islam. It's just a repetition of the same thing. It becomes very scholastic, very dogmatic. Now, uh, that's why Muslims basically le lagged behind uh, the West, and uh, as uh, as trade and the bourgeois middle class, you know, it's it created, you know, went down in the Muslim world. But in the 19th century, Muslims started to discover that some, of, at least some Muslims, tried to see that there's see the problem, and that in the Ottoman Empire, uh, which was based in Istanbul, where I come from. The Ottomans, especially in the 19th century, understand that the West has been very successful thanks to not just science, and they, which they tried to adopt, and, and, and technology, but also to institutions and ideas. And, of, and, and most importantly, the idea of freedom. Uh, that's why the Ottomans in the mid-19th century, and the Ottoman Empire at the time controlled the whole Middle East. What we call the Middle East today was the Ottoman Empire. 27 nation states emerged from the Ottoman Empire, which includes all the Arab states that we can discuss. Um, and the Ottomans in, the, in 1839 uh, had their reorganization edict, the Tanzimat, as it's called in Turkish. And among some of the important things in, the, in, that, uh, in that edict was the, securing, the further securing of property rights, that the sultan cannot confiscate anything, period. And another thing which was brought in was th the idea that people could own land. Because there was, in, in the Islamic civilization, despite... It was not a product of the Quran, but it was actually a practice adopted by, from the Sasanid Empire. That the, there was the idea that the, the, state, the land belonged to the state. And that would lead at a distribution or like a control, like a, of the land, which did not allow the rise of feudalism in Islam as it did uh, in Europe. But the Ottomans realized that you know, they should just give, bring all these things, they change all these things, and they allowed private property of the land as well. And that's why you see actually, you know, some rise of a middle class in the Ottoman Empire and some important reforms taking place. And liberalism at the time was quite fashionable both among the Turkish and the Arab intellectuals. The Arab historian Albert Hurani has a book, a fascinating book, uh, titled uh, Arabic Thought in the Liberal Age. Uh, the, this liberal age he's speaking about is the 19th and the early 20th century. Almost every you know, notable Muslim thinker at the time was fascinated by liberalism and, you know, European success through liberal ideas. But what is most striking is that this liberal age ends rapidly in the, in the second quarter of the 20th century. And instead, you see the rise of Islamism, which is, which is not Islam. It's obviously an ideology which refers to Islam. But an ideology which combines Islam with socialism and some form of nationalism. And Islamists started to look not at the liberal tradition in the West, but actually the illiberal tradition in the West. Actually, Mevdudi, the Pakistani scholar who devised much of the Islamist ideas, said fascism is a great idea. Islam should be like fascism, the Islamic state. We will only have the right idea instead of the you know, wrong idea, but we will impose it like, like, like the fascists too. So there was an admiration to these all these totalitarian ideas suddenly in the 20s and 30s. And that legacy, you know, lasted for quite a long time. It's still out there. Now, why, but why? Like, why did, if liberalism was quite popular, and that's something I address in my upcoming book, you know, uh, Islam without Extremes, a Muslim Case for Liberty, 
if liberalism was so popular in the 19th century, why did it, why did it decline so gradually and not gradually, like what so dramatically? Well, the answer is at least a big part of the answer is colonialism. In the 19th century, Muslims were independent. Under the Ottoman Empire, it was a sovereign Muslim state. It was more self-confident, you know, than what, what Muslims would become later. It, with the fall of the Ottoman Empire, all Arab states, with the exclusion of Saudi Arabia and Yemen, which no one bothered to colonize, which was very poor, <laughs> all Arab states were colonized by the Europeans, the French or the British, and Italians. Italians were the worst, you know. Um, and this colonialism ultimately created anti-colonialism, which is not a liberal way of you know, approaching. It created sol the idea of solidarity and national you know, liberation, that we should fight them. And liberalism was seen now as the tool of the imperialists to you know, come, into, you know, come into our markets and you know, corrupt our, our nation and so on. So it, the Islamic world became very defensive and reactionary. And the West was seen not as a model or an example to emulate, as it was for the Muslim reformers of the 19th century, but an enemy to fight and to resist. Uh, that's why all these radical movements in the, in the 20th century, which, some of which have gone radical enough to become terrorists, uh, something that we should, we, I you know, join, uh, like my Western friends, in, in denouncing. Uh, but they have a history. There's a, there's a reason why they became. Like in, in, in Iran, for example, uh, which became a very you know, oppressive regime after overthrowing the Shah. The reason why Iran is so anti-American is because all of the leaders of the Iranian revolution were tortured by the Shah, and the Shah was a great friend of the American government. So the reason why they, are, they have so much reaction has a reason in itself, which doesn't justify everything they do, but you know, there's, a, there's a context. So that's why I think if we want to support liberalism in the Muslim world, liberalism in the classical sense, of course, if you want to support liberalism as the Muslim world, there are things, of course, Muslim liberals will, will do. I mean, like, like the, I mean, I heard very nice speeches today about the compatibility of the New Testament and libertarianism. I mean, I can make similar arguments about the Quran. There are people who make these arguments. But one of, the, but if the West wants to help, the best thing they will do is not to attack Muslim countries and bomb and, you know, Muslim lands and reinforce the idea. Thank you. And, and not to reinforce the idea that Islam is under attack and Muslims should resist and fight. You know, and when you look at, listen to Osama bin Laden's speeches, he's delusional, but he's speaking about, oh, we are occupied here, we are occupied there, we're, and then we should go and fight them. You know, that's, just the West should be only wise not to reinforce that and rather actually make, um, uh, make the Muslims feel comfortable and safe and secure. That's when, you know, the idea of freedom will flourish. And actually, when we look at the history between Islam and the West of the past century or past two centuries, we always see that peaceful interactions between the Westerners and Muslims, like cultural interactions, trade, they help flourish, you know, new ideas in, in, among Muslims and they look at they look at the West and they say, oh, that's a good idea. They've they achieved something we can get learn from. And that is actually the Turkish, that's becoming a Turkish experience right now. Uh, and now even among the, in the Arab world, with the Arab Spring, you know, there's a, like a more interest, you know, uh, in, in, in Western democracy or open society and concepts like this. Uh, but um, it, it will go all horrible if another bomb happens or another occupation happens. Facebook and Twitter turn out to be much more liberating, you know, than, uh, than the bombs of W. Bush, you know, in that sense. So, I think this is all to say. What, what, will hap what I want to emphasize at the very end, and I would like to leave some Q&A time if you have. Islam has the potential in itself to find its own way to freedom. Christianity, were, Christianity was not at peace with freedom all the time. I mean, remember the Middle Ages, the Crusades and the Inquisition and so on? But Christians can understand their faith in various ways, as Muslims can understand their faith in various ways. Uh, but Islam, to, to find its own way to freedom, Muslims should be just given the chance to try. And it will be only with, with more peaceful relations uh, between other relations, including the West. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
15 minutes for questions. Yes, please. Uh, you touched a little bit on the root cause of uh, terrorism in the Middle East. And I, I agree with you that a lot of it has to come with the colonialization and the interventionism. And, uh, though, do you think that there is also another element to that that comes from the religious aspect? Because people do use the argument that they hate us for our freedom, and I think that's absurd, but they, they must get, be getting that from something. And I was just wondering if you believe that there is some religious element in that that is fueling some of the terrorism. Sure. The question is whether is there a religious element to uh, terrorism in the name of Islam, other than you know uh, political reasons and like reactionism, uh, reaction to the West. There is a religious element in the sense that Islam has an idea of jihad, a holy war. Um, but jihad has been understood in different ways, and the more common interpretation to understand jihad is as a defensive act. If Muslim countries are attacked, if Muslim lands are attacked, Muslims should fight back. Uh, and when you look at actually listen to sermons of the uh, terrorists or the the, the, the ideal ideologues of terrorism in the name of Islam, they would say, "Oh, we are occupied in Palestine. We are op occupied in Chechnya. We are occupied in here. We are occupied there." And they see this as a grand conspiracy against Islam. So jihad is promoted as a as an act of defense. But they go and attack innocent people, which is another actually violation of uh, the Sharia. Actually, in in medieval Islamic law. There was a clear difference between combatants and non-combatants. Uh, for example, some uh, there was a discussion in medieval texts whether Muslims can use catapults to throw rocks, you know, to cities, and some per jurists did not permit, saying that well, that will injure, you know, in, like kill innocent people in the city, not just the soldiers. So there was always this idea of combatants and non-combatants, and the jihad had this, you know, distinction between the two, and that non-combatants cannot be attacked. But now, the, what the Islamists are the the, the Islam, the terrorists and, and the, the extremists do, they try to find ways to get over that. And the, the, th the thing they say mainly is that they kill our children too. Like when they throw a bomb somewhere, you know, like th that's the way they try to justify. I'm not justifying any of that argument. You know, I think it's, it's, uh, but there is, they, they're, they refer to religion, but they could be referring to something else. Like, and, and actually it is not a surprise that today the violence that is committed in the name of Islam was committed under some other ideology a few decades ago. Like in Palestine today, the Hamas is the, you know, or the Islamic Jihad is the most, uh, you know, fanatic and they attack Israeli civilians, which I denounce, which is terrorism. But, you know, the communists were doing that 20 years ago. That was the more fashionable way of, you know, resistance or, you know, fighting. There is certainly a problem there in the region which creates anger and hatred and if like some some Christian terrorists are, uh, some Palestinian Christians are sorry sorry some Palestinian terrorists are Christian like Abu Nidal which was one of the bloodiest terrorists uh, so it it expresses itself through different ways and these days Islam has become more fashionable because of the, after the fall of you know communism and the Soviet Union and so on so there are some religious arguments they use but I think the root cause is the political context which in which they are in. And uh, their hatred, which comes from you know all, all, all of the political uh, conditions. Sorry, <laughs> isn't he a great man? I don't like. Is it? Sorry, yes, sir. I have heard different uh, from the order of the various Sirach. Order, sorry, yeah. Yeah, the order in which they're they're written. Has there been a reshuffling of those over the years? And where the Well, it's a great question. I mean, the Quran, if you take a Quran and read it today, it will look like inconsistent in terms of the uh, timing of events because the Quran was bits and pieces and the earliest Muslims decided to put them in, in, in some order and they put the longest verses, uh, the surahs in the beginning and the shortest ones at the back. But actually the ones who, which were revelated the first were the ones in the beginning. I mean, so at the end, sorry, the shortest ones. So it's when you go back in time, it's like it's like you don't read. The, there's another ordering of the Quran, which starts with the first verse re revealed, which was you know in time order. But the common Quran is not according to timeline. You know, it's it's so that's confusing in that sense. But what 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 you're asking is, I think, whether the initial uh, like surahs, which are more peaceful, then they're replaced by you know more militant surahs later. Well, that's a theme, and here's the reason. 
Prophet Muhammad had two, you know, periods. He was in Mecca for 13 years and he had 10 years in Medina. In Mecca, they were a minority, a persecuted minority by the pagans. So they were just preaching and the verses are just about, you know, uh, like God, afterlife and morality and so on. When he went to Medina, this was a new city. He, alt- he just automatically became the ruler of the city and the Meccans started to attack them and they founded an army to fight them. So there are many verses in the Medina and later, you know, uh, later verses of the Quran about war, like fight them, fight the enemies of God and, you know, so on. Some scholars in just a few, just right after Prophet Muhammad thought that the verses about war came later. So they are the ones who, which have to be taken as the most authoritative. So they defined a more militant, you know, doctrine of jihad, which was necessary for the empire. You know, the, I mean, the, we should understand that the j- jihad is a religious term, but many empires use jihad just to, you know, expand their power. I mean, um, but there is another way of understanding this as understanding like Muslims should be peaceful and the war verses only refer to the context in which they're attacked. I mean, if you're attacked, you have to protect yourself. You can understand, understand them that way. But other people have preferred to extend those verses into a, like a unified doctrine of war at will. Uh, and I, I, that's a, that's a definition that I refuse. But, you know, there are people who would, uh, who have done that. And that was mainly re- for political reasons. They preferred that, uh, more, you know, militant doctrine of jihad. Um, you're welcome, please. Yes, sir. Okay, well, Akipi is not a bunch of Islamic scholars, but, you know, that's a good point. Well, thank you. It's a good question. Well, and it is, maybe you can all be interested in my book. There's a chapter about it called Freedom from the State, <laughs> and I deal with the idea of caliphate. The caliphate is a creation by Muslims. It's not a creation of the Quran. Yes, but actually, I, I, have, I have an issue with the Hadiths. I mean, Hadiths... Exactly, exactly, exactly. That's why I think the Sharia should be revised and, you know, looked at the... The thing is, here is the thing. What is divinely mandated and what is man-made? That is a big question for all Muslims. The Quran, every Muslim understands as God's revelation. But then, what about the Prophet's practices? Or the practices of the Muslims who were close to the Prophet? Are they also, you know, binding? And that's a big question. And most Sharia scholars in the Middle Ages, you know, took all these binding and, you know, they developed a very extensive, you know, like a legal doctrine. My take and the take of other Muslims who are more reformist minded would be say, would be to say, well, the prophet, you know, received revelation from God, but he acted as a human being in his own time and milieu. So not every thing he did is binding forever. Uh, and actually there are, Episodes within the Hadiths to justify this point of view. For example, uh, during one of the wars, the battles between the Meccan pagans and the Medinan Muslims, the Muslims army had to camp somewhere. And the Prophet say, said, let's camp here. And one of his companions come and ask him, is this God's revelation or is this your idea? When he says, it's my idea, then he says, okay, well, I think differently. Let's do that. And the prophet listens, and you know, according to the hadith, and that happens. Now that tells me that anything besides revelation can be disputed, or can be put in context. I mean, prophet did this, well, he was a 7th century Arab living in his time and milieu. I mean, the reasons why, for example, Muslims wear a turban and have a long beard, is that they say, oh, prophet dressed that way. Well, even the pagans dressed that way, that's the fashion of the time, you know? (laughs) So, contextualizing these things is, I think, a good way to understand. The prophet did so, 
we can understand the purpose and the meaning, but we don't have to take it today. Unfortunately, there is a very literalist understanding of the Prophet, and some Muslims have said, well, voting is against Islam because the Prophet did not vote. Well, he did not use a toothbrush, he did not drive a car, and if you go with that logic, I mean, there's, you'll just go back to the Middle Ages, for 14th century back. Uh, my take, and the institution of the Caliphate, Prophet died and Muslims did not know what to do, and they just discussed and they said, well, let's have a leader among us and let's call him the Caliph. So it was a human institution created by the Muslims according to norms of the time. So I think the big issue for Muslims is to be able to distinguish between their core principles of their religion and the way those principles were put in practice by Muslims in the context of the 7th century or the 8th or 9th century. Uh, and now there's a big effort to distinguish these things. And in Turkey, for example, theologians are discussing these things. And let's say, let's dis distinguish what is historical and what is, what is, uh, what is religious. And I think it's, it's possible. And hadiths, questioning, the questioning of the hadiths, the sayings of the Prophet, and putting them in context would be very helpful in that regard. Uh, yes, sir. And I'll come back to that. Um, we'll see. <laughs> it is a good thing, ultimately, because, I mean, these dictators... Well, we, I don't know what will happen in Libya, because the dictator in Libya is the craziest of all. And, I mean, there are rational dictators, and they're crazy dictators. So the rational ones understand that they're withdrawn, so they just leave the country and go and live in a nice you know, home in some luxury place. But the irrational, the crazy ones, want to keep power, and they start, you know, genocidal acts. So in Libya, that's... That's where we're heading, and that's very scary. But it, in terms of when we speak about Tunis and Egypt, they, yeah, I mean, the overthrowing of those dictators was, was good for that country. The, and it is very interesting that those dictators in Tunis and uh, Egypt, and now there's a pattern in all these countries. There was a colonial period. The colonial power is you know, pushed away by some liberator, and the liberator established his own tyranny. You know, that, that, that's mostly a socialist party. Like in Tunis, it was this modernist socialist party. In Alger Algeria, it was the socialist party, the FLN. So, so being independent doesn't always make you free. So, I mean, that, that's something, you know, we can infer from those examples. So what hap but what happened was, though, in those countries, in Tunisia and Egypt, with the dictators which ruled the, the country um, justified themselves to the West especially, by saying, oh, if we go, the radical Islamists will come and they will be worse than us, you know. And, you know, they will be anti-Israel, they, they won't help your, you know, like foreign policy goals and so on. But the radical Islamists had emerged in the first place because they were, you know, suppressed by these people. And when you look at Ikhwan, like you see the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, you see they, they becoming more and more strident because they're persecuted by the regime. Like the uh, Sayyid Qutb, the big ideologue of Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, he was he was an Islamist to begin with, but he was more mild in the beginning, and he spent many years in the prisons of uh, Nasser under heavy torture. And his latest tracks were like, "Let's fight these infidels and godless, you know, rulers and so on." And from there, you had so it was a vicious cycle that you had the dictator, the West says, "Oh, let's keep him in power because he's good for us," and that's why you were having the you know hatred against you. I mean, why do they hate us? Well, go and ask the people in Cairo why do they hate you. Uh, or go and ask the people in Gaza why do they hate you when bombs are falling on their head, you know. like So, uh, but toppling of those dictators, and it's, it's phenomenal that the Ikhwan Muslim in Egypt, or the Islamists in Tunis, they did not go out and say, hey, we want an Islamic regime right now. They said, oh no, we want to be in a democratic game. That's a lesson from, from, probably they learned from Turkey's ruling party, the AKP, which coming from, it's coming from a, an Islamist background, but reformed itself to a quite you know, democratic position. Uh, and I, that's why I think the, the myth that if the secular dictators go, Islamists will come and establish a worse tyranny is broken by these examples. I, Iran certainly you know, uh, like was something which consolidated that idea, but now we are seeing examples which contradict that idea. And, and I think many people can now see that the Arabs, after all, they want freedom too. They don't hate your freedoms. Uh, they hate the fact that they were, their freedoms were crushed by the dictators, which were partly supposed by the West. 
Uh, yes, sir. Oh, oh sorry. Last question. Last question. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I very much prefer the Scottish to Enlightenment to the French one as well. Uh, the, what is unfortunate for the Muslim world that we have faced only the French Enlightenment. So Enlightenment came as an anti-religious idea, uh, first to Turkey uh, and then to the Arab world. So this we had this dichotomy between either you will be enlightened and godless. Or you will be a believer and reject everything that is new and, and Western or modern and so on. Um, that's why I think discovering the Anglo-Saxon tradition, which is not very much known in the Muslim world, or the American way of separation of church and state, which is, again, not much known. I mean, in Turkey, sec secularism means the, the headscarf will be banned by the regime, and you know, Islamic institutions will be closed down. That's what is secularism in Turkey. And no Muslim wanted that, of course. No, you know. So... Uh, the, so that's one thing to put on, to put on what you said. As for the, yeah, I mean, Islam does not have a reformation in the sense that, you know, uh, Christianity has because there is no pope to reform. Actually, the problem is that there's no central authority. Uh, unlike the Catholic Church, you know, there was this, you know, central authority and the Christ, uh, Protestants, uh, rebelled against that. Maybe Islam is maybe a bit closer to Judaism than Christianity. Because of this idea of law, because of its, of its understanding of God and so on. And maybe the, the Jewish response to enlightenment is, is maybe something which can be more helpful in understanding Islam. When Jews faced enlight, enlightenment, some of them said, well, let's change some things in our tradition. They became the reformed Jews. Some remained the Orthodox. Some remained, you know, some became conservative in the middle. And I think that process is going on and right now in the Muslim world. The question is, will Muslims be pluralist enough to, you know, well, some Muslims will be very, very conservative, and so be it if they want to live that way. The question is, will they just be that way and impose that to others? And that discussion is really going on in the Muslim world right now. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite optimistic to be, uh, I mean, reasonably, but uh, I'm optimistic about what will happen. And it, it is mainly related with dynamics in the Muslim world but it's also related with dynamics between the Muslim world and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you.